if you bought this block, you'd want to sell it, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're already a bit water. <laughs> it was all right with Tim Ward. I didn't say that. Tim, they're a bit nasty. Where'd he go? Oh, he's, he's, he's crying for a little bit, sort of a bowie thing. That was going to be part of the dam, one. The thing is, though, you'd be. <laughs> it's going to become a boat ramp again to believe this hose running long enough. thing you look at is, so the water in, you know, a couple of minutes was down to there, from up there. And it always amazes me, every time I do this, as to how much longer the water takes before it leaves this site. Even though it's concrete, this hard ground, it'll still take a while before the water leaves. And will it leave on the end? No, all through it. So through it. what's happening is because the water's running to this site, we say, where's it going? It's now going in the ground. So our landscape used to end up with <coughs> the areas where it accumulated water would lose fertility. So you go into a wetland system. And what they did originally was they drained the wetland system so they could grow crops there. But after about three years or five years, it didn't grow crops anymore because the fertility disappeared, because all the fertility, like a rainforest, was held in the surface. And it was losing fertility through the landscape. But all of this down here, what did it grow? Yeah. <coughs> Grasses. So that wetland fed the grassland, which was your, your um, floodplain system. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to grow grasslands with nothing feeding. No hydrology and no fertility. The moment you put a contour system in, something that acts like a wetland, even if it didn't actually exist there before, the moment you put that into place, you've now got something feeding grassland. Mm. Now, if you, because you've now got this area wetter, what other plants could you grow there that you couldn't grow yesterday? Mm. Possibly in the channel, yep. What about below it? Deciduous type trees. Well. Deciduous yeah. trees. Pl whatever plants it takes to build fertility. Because the more fertility we build along that line, the better everything functions down here. So if you want to support a monoculture, doesn't matter whether it's a grassland or a crop, you must feed it with biodiverse nutrients. So create the area of biodiverse nutrients, then use water and gravity to feed it. That's how the Australian landscape used to function. It was, the name was coined the Step Diffusion System of Broadacre Hydroponics because it is feeding water and fertility through the root zones of plants. So today, what we tend to be doing, probably all over with our grazing management, is we want to introduce and encourage more perennials. Yeah? So more perennial plants. But that's not how the Australian landscape used to be. The Australian landscape used to be a balance of perennials and annuals. That's what we need. Why do we not grow the annual plants today? Possibly. It's another reason. <coughs> yeah, could they're be. The sweetest. They're the sweetest and they've been eaten out. They've certainly been eaten out. So, okay, what's an annual grass that you would grow up here or you guys grow that you consider to be good fodder? Dry grass. Dry grass? Okay, so. Where does ryegrass grow? Does it grow in your most fertile soil or the least fertile soil? In the most fertile soil. So, what's the answer to why there are no annual grasses or many annual grasses? Lost fertility. There's no fertility in the surface. And the more we drive to a perennial system, the less fertility we'll have in the surface because we're not focusing up here about getting the fertility to the top, which is what we need to have. We need to have our fertility in the surface. All you guys, that grow vegetables or any of those small crops like that, you need to have your, your fertility up here on the top, not underneath. You haven't made those, you wouldn't want any eucalypts along there either, No. Well, eucalypts yeah. were 2% of the forest. So you could have the, the balance of 2%. And the eucalypts role was to be the big canopy tree that prevented that evapotranspiration, evapotranspired water leaving that system. 
because the eucalypts are very good at holding that moisture down. So that was their role. The moment we start putting them everywhere, they no longer actually grow to their habit. Their habit is tall, big top. Now they just go, because they're lazy. They just spread out at the bottom and don't grow big, tall trees. So you put them into a situation where there's competition and they go up and out. Yeah? So it's about understanding the tree and the type of plants you need to have in that system. What other plants, what else could we do here at the bottom of the contour? We're managing our water so that we know the banks in there. This is only a small one, but obviously you would look to, you could, you could build it quite a bit bigger than this. But now that you're managing the water, what else could you do here? Like what other things could you put here? Rain crops. Cover crops. Yep, shrubs. Yep. What if we grabbed our compost from down here and we put it up here if we had to put it there before, the water washed it away. Now we can put fertility there, can't be washed away. It only ever disappears at the rate at which it breaks down. So as it decomposes, which is where the compost touches the soil, that's where decomposition takes place. Now it's only the liquid compounds that leak down here. That's what this Australian landscape used to be. It was a liquid fertility system, all transported by water every time it rained. So this is what this system is recreating. So when we build this, we've got to read our landscape. So we can see there's a flow line over here, and there's a small flow line comes down through here, and in the middle we've got a raised section. So this is the middle of our floodplain or our ridge. We're up on the side of the hill, this is our ridge. So when we create an area where we're going to exit the water, it's always on the ridge. It's never in the hollow. Why? Why? It will, yeah. But how does how do we how, do, how does it not erode on the ridge? What's the thing that prevents it? Yeah, because of the shape, that's right. So the keeps, it keeps dispersing it. So what you, we'll, we'll create a little spillway there in a second. And so when that water spills and it starts to recollect down here, we repeat it. We bring it back to here again. Constantly bring it back to the middle. And so you look at the pattern, recreating the same patterns you see everywhere, you just pay no attention. <laughs> the patterns. So Stuart, I'm in a quite a bit different situation. Yeah, everybody is. Yeah. <laughs> and I have tree crops, apples and cherries, on steep country. Yep. And I have tram lines. And those tram lines are just getting eroded. And the wind what, are you, what are you growing? Apples, cherries. Apples and cherries. Yep. So that wheel mark is getting all the work. And so if you're going to go and put something on after it rains, it turns it up. Next you're not going to like what I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> We've been something. working with the macadamia guys down at Lismore. And they're challenging. They're probably more challenging than you because they wouldn't even be here today. <laughs> so you're here, which makes a big difference. Oh, okay. We've got one guy. <laughs> okay, so what you look at doing is recreating this same situation, but it means you'll have to remove some trees. So you have to be prepared to remove some trees. Otherwise, you you could do it all by hand. So John's got, he's got avocados on steep country. You could build individual little banks in front of every tree, but you do it all with a hoe, which is a fair bit of work. But the erosion is really happening in the wheel marks out there. So would you be trying to just put a, that across several rows? Yeah, but you've got to work out where's the water <coughs> going to go. At some point it's got to go somewhere. You can't hold mm. it all. Mm. So it has to go somewhere. So you have to have a point. There's a macadamia farm out here at Lower Wonga and we did a design for them and that requires them. It's on bloody steep country and soil's just leaving there like it wasn't even necessary. And, and that's what we did. We found areas where we could al alleviate the pressure of the water so we could distribute it somewhere which wasn't where the rows, in your case, where your tram tracks are or where their trees were. So it could it soon end up like a drainage system, like a zigzag down the hill. It that could. Is that what you want it to be, or you're saying that's how it could end up the way it's going? If you, well, at the moment it's just all flushing all my fertility and soil yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. In the wheel mark, the rest is quite yeah. good. Yeah, but so if you get it really flat, it's got to go somewhere. But then it so are you, have you got grass underneath your trees, yeah. or is it there? Yeah, it's all grass. Is it raised? Yeah. So it's raised where the trees are. Yeah. Makes it difficult because it yeah. keeps sending all the water back into the low point all the exactly. time, which is where your wheel tracks yeah. are. Um, but I can see that sort of, so if this was an alley here just on a, a normal, and it had wheel marks, the idea is to stop that erosion of the wheel marks. Yes, but, but part of the problem, and I don't know whether you can do it in your situation, 
what I advise guys who are out in the you know the bigger cattle blocks, they have this insistence of driving in the same place all the time. It's like they've got no imagination. They can't actually think that they can drive slightly to one side. So you try to get them to think about why don't you just move the wheels, the wheel track across, and then when you come back, move it over here, and then keep doing that. Guess what happens? The ground goes like concrete like this, but it grows the grass horizontally, which protects it from erosion. So I don't know whether you're able to do that or not, yeah. but it's a consideration. We've them in close now that it's, you know, you haven't no got, room to move. No room to move. But I could see that we could put probably hay or something, I cut the tops off the trees and mulch all that top, and it ruined the wheel mark. Fantastic. And we had a two inch of overnight, <laughs> and it got into that furrow, and it just took the whole, like, 100 metres of road to the bottom. So yeah. And you think, actually, but that, but could you the bottom of the wheel mark was so hard. Could you grab all the wheel tracks and build it up? So it, you know, <coughs> you can do all those sorts of things, it's very costly. It is, that. I know, but it doesn't have to take its trees out, does it? No, but it's not, I mean, taking the trees out, you're taking a row of trees out to have a contour that manage, if you can manage the water at the top, you manage 60% of the water at the top, yeah. then you haven't got all that water racing down yeah, the hill. Yeah. And the thing is that the every every metre more that that water flows, it's gaining more and more energy. And the more particles it carries with it, the more erosive it is. Mm. So every mm. time you break it and stop it, it's now got to, it's like you, you're running up this hill and then you go, <laughs> you stop, you've got to go again. Every time you pull it up, it's got to start again. So if you break that, even if it was just with little banks like this between the rows and have it spill out <clears throat> under the trees if they're well vegetated, you know it's going to run back in here because the shape's going to do that. So we could almost take the, that bit of soil and put there with the front and loader. No, make the pond yeah. up in on the top. Same yeah, way. But like, use that bit of soil below it to make a dam. No, make no, a... exactly the same as I've done here. So this is the hill, just the same. Just take this piece of material out to form a bank across. But you can do it with a hoe. You don't need to do it with a machine, yeah. depending on how deep the yeah, burrows are. Yeah. Well, I did a zone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have a contact <laughs> with so what we'll do is we'll create our spillway so we look at what the high water mark is and whatever we want the high water mark to be that's our spill point and our spill point we want to be well vegetated so you don't spill that somewhere where it's going to be bare so if you're going to be cropping you're now not going to be cropping this area because you're actually going to crop that area if you're a cropper of some sort because this area you want to be well vegetated. And if you're, let's say you're, whatever you're doing, some form of crop down along here, then every time that water tries to run onto the area where you're cropping, you bring another bank back to the middle. You keep bringing it back to the middle all the time. So your ridges end up um, well vegetated and because they're higher than that, the ridge is now feeding all of that country. But it's the hydrology that you will see the effect on him mostly in your orchard. If you put this, and I was going to get, to get into it with the macadamias. So a guy that spent years being beaten around the head by PA, left Bylong, went to there, bought a farm, planted macadamias up and down the hill. Oh. Other than, so all the things that he learned, like the first time I went there, I said, what the did you do that for? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's what you've got to do. Got to do it. Can't plant the macadamias across the slope because they drown, too wet, can't harvest. All these excuses. I said, that's bullshit. That's not right. Yeah. Anyway, here we are. Fast forward 10 or 15 years, and he just went through, and he removed a section of trees, because we ran a course there last year on his place. He's removed a section of tree, trees on the contour, when you drive in there, you ask Megan, it's like chalk and cheese. The trees on the bottom side are just glowing, dark green, healthy, and all the ones on the top side are light green. So changing the hydrology changes the function of the plants. So the moment you create this change in hydrology where water's going in and then coming out, all the plants on this side are all your high fertility plants. All the ones that grow in there are not your production ones. They're not going to feed your livestock. You're not going to harvest them that they make all of this grow better. So when you do your, your uh, bank there, are you not ripping this bit, or are you actually just putting a bank on top of the ground? You're just digging this section out, <coughs> and 
replacing like, the material there. Ripper, or would that go down no. the, at the wrong, wrong tool? We won't get it level. Right. So you've still got to be, be prepared for unlimited capacity. So you want this to be level, even though you're going to spill the water out here, which I was about to do. And we determine our high water mark. And this one we bring up. Hardest in the country I've ever had to do this on. And I thought the last one was harder. Last week I was at Narrabri, which was on black soil, and I thought, Jesus, this is it's like glue. That must have had no organic matter in it, though. It had no organic matter. It was the Sydney University where you go to learn everything. <laughs> No, because the, the, the scientists that were there were still happy to talk to me afterwards. But it was dead. It was absolutely dead. There was no life in that Did whatsoever. It have good NPK. It would have had tons of it. <laughs> And they had banks this big drain all the way across their cropping country. When I went there last year, I think I went there, and I said they wanted that because they received... This is how things are changing. They, were, they were bequeathed money to do research on natural sequence farming. Oh, you're kidding me. And they weren't doing it. That's no, the they were, that's, what they, that's what they had to do. That's why they, they sent one person to do our course at Ebor last year, and then they had me come over there. I said I could send PA, but it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so when you talk about... And so in relation to putting... Um, you're talking about putting the, um, uh, to put the nutrients back in the soil. Yep. So somebody that puts um, manure all over their paddy is not necessarily doing the right thing because it's all washed down into, the, into that gully. That's one thing. You think about it. What happens when you've got a, a carbon source that you create a bigger surface area on? So the moment you spread that over a bigger area, you minimise, you increase the surface area of that same product, which means most of it actually goes up to the atmosphere. So you'd be better to put it on the bank. Yeah. So if you put and a if you put a pile up here or a windrow under here where it's protected, can't be washed away. Yes. The only risk of oxidation is the top, but that material will cap. It'll create a cap over it, which means it's safe. The only stuff that gets used is what's in contact with the soil as it gets broken down. And then the rainfall that falls leaks through that, carries that fertility down here. But that doesn't build the fertility. That just encourages the other plants to come that build the fertility. It's only plants that build fertility. And unfortunately, it's not necessarily the ones that you want to feed your cattle. So what, what, <laughs> what, what, what you're saying is these people that are using feedlot manure through spreaders are be better off just dumping it in, in heaps in the, in the paddock. Spot on. Yep. Uh, yep. Same with your animals that die. Put them up there. You know, most farmers that I know of um, are probably so ashamed that the animal died so they stick it down there in the gully, bottom of the hill. <laughs> so everything it took to grow that animal now washes away. So you've lost an opportunity. Put the animal up there and forget about what anybody else thinks or put it in that little, little pit here. No one will be able to see it. And then as it breaks down, the fertility will leak out over your landscape, feeding it. So it's good. Benefit. But you've got to manage the water because the water is the one thing that's carrying everything away. So depending on how much water you get, can you use plants, plant it crossways as sure. you're growing? To yeah, most definitely. Up? They're your end result. This is merely to get you to there. Right. So you've got to manage the water because at the moment you've lost the plants, so the plants aren't able to do the job. Yeah. Any of these systems are just about getting the plants back in there. If you can do it with plants, then by all means, do it with them. But what, what are you only clearing? Um, it's not too bad, but it depends how it's done. Now, if we're losing our fertility down and off, and we create a crack in the big opening in the ground, and like most farmers, if six inches is good, 12 inches is better, yeah? So everyone wants to go 12. If 12 is good, then 24 is better, and if we can't pull it, we need a bigger tractor. Yeah? This is how we think. So you've got to realise this is the process. This is the biggest problem is how people think. So now we've put it in 24 inches or we're still at 12. There's all our fertility. 
what plant are you going to get to feed well and have high productivity having to drag it out from 12 inches? So you've now minimised the productivity. Eh? A cotton wool. Well, there's lots of plants that'll do it, but they're not efficient, especially if you're growing them to feed a plant, an uh, animal, sorry, because you want it to be able to be growing rapidly. So what are the most nutritious plants you can grow? The ones that have the fertility and the water closest to the surface. Ooh, what about lucent? No. Lucent is lucent is a your father of always. <laughs> no, I, I used to, I made lucent hay for I spent years bailing up lucent hay. It was never just pure no, lucent. in pastures. Yeah, but in it's your the, the, I can, well, okay. There's one thing about lucent. Lucent goes against all the rules of nature. So you can have a worn out, buggered soil and loosen it, it's still growing. So it doesn't grow as a result of the fertility. So it actually has the ability to grow in an area that it shouldn't and it extracts the last bit it could possibly get out of it. The other thing it does, a bit like a gum tree really, is that it, it cuts off all the moisture around the surface first. So it kills everything else. And then it's just one loosen plant in a bare paddock. And just to add to that, is animals don't like eating lucerne, so they eat everything else out from, the lucerne, from around it. So all of these things all added up. You must have the wrong lucerne. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Our cattle are going for the lucerne first. Elk, yeah. elk, elk cattle eat and the lucerne now. Right oh, down. In amongst, the when you put them and in amongst. And you got anything else? Rose, grass, and grass. Ah, there, that's a difference. Yeah. There's yeah, a big right difference. So what no, you're telling you me, they, you what you're telling me, you're, you're, else you're, else. Um, you're growing grasses that are even below lucerne. He's right. We've got brassicas and, and no, but it, I pulled a lucerne plant out, and its root is over a metre deep. Yeah, but they go, they go down oh, 20 right. feet. Yeah. We had, the, we'd have lucerne down in the water table on our floodplain at Bolong. They grow great guns, but. Once again, it comes back to management, oh. and that's reliant on you being a good manager. I'm just assuming right. that all of you are bad managers. Yeah. I'm not taking any other assumptions. Sorry, I'm not taking any other assumptions okay. because because the thing is that you might be a good manager, but the person that comes after you might not be. So we're about setting up a system so that it functions even with bad managers. And so, as I said, the way nature deals with that is it throws in a prickly plant or something that can't be eaten. You know, so I'll put in a bush or a thorny plant, whatever, and anywhere across the entire landscape it'll do it. Nature. It's the, what nature does. I mean, Africa is a perfect example. Every time another an animal came in that ate that plant, well, nature over time came up with a different plant that it couldn't eat. Or it, put, or it created a poison. So it killed that animal. And then the animal learned it can't eat it. <clears throat> but we need them here. So I'm glad you asked. Why, <laughs> so do, we need, why do, do we need? Why do we need those lantana? plants? Is that what you're saying? Yes, you could. You could plant lacina, anyway. but realise that it will attract the animal for longer, and so there is a risk that they may bear the bank of grass whilst you're feeding the lacina. Now, why is it important that all those plants that were in Africa or America or the UK? Why is it important that they're here? It's all so we can bring in the big bees. Right. The herbivores that eat them? Partly along that line. Because yeah. we're farming the same way. The because if, if we've introduced animals from somewhere else, we must have the plants that evolve to manage those animals. If we don't, then we are buggered. So we have to have them. Either that or get rid of the animals, which I can't see happening. So therefore we must have the plants. I think that's what I've noticed when I was chatting Australia is by far the most disturbed landscape I've ever worked in because it's all been fiddled with. Mm -hmm. and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but other than maybe the dinosaur, which is pretty monogastric, Australia didn't have ruminants no. mm -hmm. at all. Zip, zero, none, not one. They had kangaroos and other things. Yeah. And, and the system would have, this is my simple other continent view, the animals that you had here were suited to what you had. Then we, <coughs> we've got this thing with four feet and, and a big mouth and a rumen. And we said, go and eat the stuff that kangaroos eat. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. Well, they did, though. That was, the, that was part of the problem. At a low rate, I think. That, no, but they yeah, ate all the palatable ones out first. 100%. So they ate those, which was the start of the destruction of this landscape. Yeah. Because they were the most palatable ones. But they were the ones that were managing 
the leachates from the gum tree. They were the yeah. ones adding the fertility back into the system were also the ones that the cattle or the sheep, probably the sheep initially, decided that they were licorice yeah. and they hammered them. And our poor management allowed for it. Didn't even notice it, yeah. Didn't even notice it. We don't, we still don't notice it today. Yeah. And we still consider that plant good, that plant bad. You know, everywhere I go, I try to find out what's the hated plant. You know, up here, <laughs> I know it's lantana. Everyone hates lantana. Or GRT, giant rat star, we hate that too. They're there for a reason. They are there for a reason. We have to, our job is to ask <coughs> why. Well, if you why look back is that in your diary, you'll find all the reasons they're there. Yes, that's right. You're right. You're right, 100%. Now, if you, if you were to come back, if you were to come back here tomorrow or the next day, you run this experiment, this experiment again, you will find it will take longer again for water to actually start leaving this site. Every time you turn that tap on, it will take more and more water before anything leaves. And all you've done is slow the rate at which it can run across the top. Sorry. If you're going to grow all your lush green grass up here, you're still going to attract the cattle Exactly. What was the one area I said you had to be careful of where you sure. manage your animals? The on the steps. So you fence yeah. it off if you're Take it's your management. Out. It's your management. You know, if you're going to have the animals in here and you know, and I can tell you straight away, they will come to that area because this is where the sweetest plants will be. That's the area they concentrate on. So when do you determine when it's time to move them? When the plants is. When they've eaten that. Yeah. Doesn't matter if all this is still here. If this is still here, then you need to change your way you manage your animals because you're allowing them to concentrate on that area too much and not enough in here or you lift the density, whatever the case may be but they will always favour this. But the thing that you'll find will happen is every year... It will get sweeter. Every year that gets bigger. Every year it gets bigger. Now, there's one other rule... That poor bloody ticket bloke coming next and he doesn't know. No, he, he doesn't. But there's... Um, what was I going to say? Something else. Every year there's another rule. Every year. Rule 36. Oh, yes. Now, for all of you holistic grazing, block your ears. Because I'm going to tell you something that breaks the rules that, that Alan Savory talks about in this landscape. The moment your landscape is being fed with liquid and nutrients, you can graze this endlessly. And it will make no difference. Because it's being fed water and fertility. What's the thing that fails in a rotational system where we have no hydrology or fertility working? It's the ability of the plant to respond and come back to grow enough root mass to survive, to recover. The moment it's being fed, there's less reliance on that. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do that because I still think the rotational system is the best way to go. But you will find that this will create difficulties in your system because this will be recovered in seven days and this will be four weeks or whatever time might be. So well, I've got two paddocks to manage. Don't you? That's right, you might change your management, or if this bit is taking four weeks to recover, what would you do? Put another drain in. Put another drain uh, uh, yeah. You get back to South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> That's your bond. All day I've been saying the same thing. <laughs> and I think it was repeated over here too. So both of you go with it. Small ditch. Another contour. What did you say, John? Horizontal ditch. What that means is at this point, the hydrology is stopped. So the ability for that, and if you look carefully, you'll find that this land slope slightly flattened at this point and then fell again. That was the end. That was the end of your hydrology at this point. So had you been able to read it, you would have known that's where your bank was going to go anyway. Yes, Stuart, in real life, you'd extend this on the contour. All the way. Up, up wherever you've got to go to get across that gully. Exactly. Everywhere. Wherever you've yep. got to go to be yep. on contour. Yeah. Not yeah. over there or would, whatever. Which, which is not me driving a tractor with no, a different one. No, no, no. So, yeah, that's right. So you, you extend the contour as far as you possibly can because there's another part to this, managing energy. So there's two parts. One, you're kick-starting the hydrology. Every time it rains, the hydrology starts again. Presently, when it rained on this site, you saw what happened. No hydrology was started, did it? It ran off. And unfortunately, a lot of our landscape is represented mm -hmm. by this. This is what it's like. Everywhere I go, this is what it looks like. Yeah. You know, it might be differing soils, but it still just sheds water like that. Mm -hmm. So, every time it rains, 
just with that little structure there, you're starting to kickstart the hydrology, right? So that's important because we work on rain events. No snow melts, no slow snow melts or ice melts. One big rain event. And when it's been a dry period like it was 18 months ago, you lose the most on the first rain event. All of your fertility disappears in that one rain event, gone. If you can manage that and keep that at least there, you lose it from where De Berg is to there, but at least you've captured it there. Now if you can harvest the material that grows in the fertility that was lost from up there and return it back to De Berg, you've now lost nothing. None yeah. of which we do. So if you do none of what this is and just use plants that would be still and not graze those plants, would that slowly... Yes, of course it will. Very slowly get there? Yeah, of course it will. It's, it's us that undoes everything. It's us that undoes everything. This bank here is to manage our animals. If we left the landscape alone, it would just build itself. It will take a bit longer. Yeah. And most of us are in a hurry. We don't want to wait five years, ten years, yeah. twenty years. We want it to happen now. So, so long as we know what you know what the plants were going to do, then it's our job to. Well, it can be our job to try and help them do their job. Mm -hmm. This is one thing I'm noticing is that you've still got to build a time factor in. It doesn't matter. Like you can you can have a go at throwing as much many ideas and as much technology and as much diesel and everything as it as you as you can. You still got to have a time factor in it because we've spent a fair bit of time undoing it and it won't just come together all of a sudden. You know, bingo. But we've got to monitor as we are as it is coming back and watch what's going. And then that proves up that what we are doing is moving forward. So we've got to keep moving forward and watch what we're doing and manage to go forward. But the point is there is a time factor involved in it. It won't happen to go tomorrow. And someone asked me the question, I think you did, Murray, over there about because that gully was well vegetated and all those sorts of things. So we've done a great job. We've been holistically manage, managing our animals and the, and the area is, has recovered with vegetation, which is really good. What's the one thing that we haven't been able to achieve with those animals, though? Hydration. We haven't got that water back out of the gully up onto there. And this is the thing I think a lot of people may miss in the holistic management side of things. Possibly. You can correct me whether I'm wrong. But they just I think it's assumed that everybody's going to do this, in which case if everyone did it, it would be good. But the real fact of it is not everybody's going to do it. So we have to work on the fact that there's a percentage of people that will never actually start managing their animals mm. properly mm. or will never remove, go away from ploughing their, their paddocks to plant a crop, set stocking or whatever. Um, that's probably not going to happen. So what do we do in the interim? Because let's say Tim and Amber here, they become the representation or the model for other people to follow. That's going to take years before people actually do it. Slowly, some people will come on board You know, this year and then another five years, somebody else. But it takes time. In the meantime, we need our landscape to be building. We can't wait for everyone to do it, because if if De Berg's up there sending all the water down here and his fertility, well, by God, I want it to build my place, because he obviously doesn't want it. <laughs> so let's put something in place so that we get the fertility and the water back out into our landscape. Eventually, he'll work out that he's losing so much that he'll go, well, what are you doing there, Amber? What are you? Oh, this is what I'm doing. Oh, I might do that too. And so it goes. So the system builds. So how do we get the water back out of that gully? That's the, that's the trick. Because if you fixed your place and you're not losing, I guarantee you somebody else is. So you want to make sure you get that back out. And the other thing is that our fertility is still moving to the low point. So we've still got most of our fertility held in our lowest part of our landscape, of which we can't utilise. Or if we do, we'll damage the whole thing or potentially damage the, the ability for it to function again. So if we have something in place so that we can bring some of that material out, back up onto the high ground, then we are going to be far more successful. Have you done anything sure with the GPS tracking, like the flyover sort of survey stuff for the whole of farm sort of plans? Or? I don't. I've got a guy that does farm plans for people. That's not my skill. Well, uh, have you seen any results of that, with this type of thing? Or? You mean actually putting stuff in place? or? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we've done contours all over the place. Are we yeah. seeing? You mean are we seeing a change in the? Look, I just mean a whole of property plan that someone might have developed their own sort of stuff from day one with the plan. Oh, you mean done the whole property? Yeah. Yeah, not that I know of. No. Not the whole property, but it's not what we recommend either. Right. 
what we recommend is doing one one contour to manage the highest amount of the, the water at the highest part of your landscape initially and then watch to see. I would expect the rest of it to evolve over a five year period or somewhere thereabouts when they're doing, they've d decided that that actually makes sense. So you just put one, one, your fertility one up and then wait. <coughs> water and fertility, yep. Most definitely. Now, Bloss, you're going to what I said that every farmer wants to do. If one's good, then ten's got to be better. But you've got to keep fighting that urge because you don't really prove anything. See, when you, when you see that make a difference from there to here, that proves that it works. So then you repeat it because you know that it worked, so it should work again. It really spoiled the country, and I know that after that, the water that comes off there is going to burn down there. But you can't spill this water over that. That's why you capture it no, there. No, but the rain that falls there is going to rush down. Okay, well in that instance, maybe you would look at doing multiple. Another one. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. That's right. <laughs> Excuse me, Stuart. Right. Excuse me. Um, I think Ian's keen for people who want a cup of tea.